Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, so let me let me take you back to a world pre-pandemic. And I think um, I think the opening question for you, for someone who's so experienced in the world of media, is media was one of the first industries that was disrupted mag massively by the internet, um, and everything was digitalized, and um, and you had to change your way of working. I suppose, from your perspective, how did that impact you? But also, how have you seen the rest of the world, both pre-pandemic and through the pandemic, adapt to themselves to the world of um, digital and, and the internet? You know, I started out as a broadcast journalist, which was you know classic kind of local news food and farming. Then I went to Channel 4 and I was young, I was maybe, you know, 23. And literally I arrived. And, <laughs> you know, I was kind of, I was, I was kind of this little kind of, you know, spreadsheet mole. And my boss kept saying, look, you, you, you know, you can do more, let's do more. You're a journalist, let's do more. And then they were like, hey, you use the internet. Uh, you're on Facebook. Um, I think you should be in charge of launching Channel 4 on, on Bebo, on MSN, on YouTube. Um, that was the beginning for me, you know. So I was in charge of launching Channel 4 on all of these platforms. Yeah. And yeah, I guess I was what they call like digital native, you know. It was, it was, it was kind of my, my world back then. So I, I watched this stuff like a hawk. Mm. And I've been working in this game, I guess, since I was kind of 18, 19 years old. Um, and I've taken lots of twists and turns. A lot of it spent behind the camera. And I was a commissioning editor at Channel 4 in charge of product projects that sat across TV and online. So, you know, again, we're kind of doing new stuff and building new technology and getting the audience to interact with the television show in new ways. Um, um, and then the last 10 years, I've done more of a kind of traditional role and I've been in front of the camera um, and I've had the absolute privilege of traveling around the world and, you know, see, meeting people that, you know, basically live very, very healthy lives and meeting some of the people that live kind of, you know, the longest lives around the planet through all the programs that I make around food and health. So when the pandemic hit, I've watched this stuff, I guess, the ebbs and flows of kind of digital and media and how it all interplays for, for a couple of decades. And it's just been, it's been fascinating. It's been fascinating. You know, I mean, for me in my kind of day job, obviously everything stopped, everything stopped. Um, and before I knew it, you know, shows that needed to transmit urgently, you know, a courier was turning up at my door with a voiceover kit, plonking on the floor and then running away. And then I was recording it in my wardrobe. <laughs> um, and they were finishing the show. I think the first ones really did sound pretty terrible. And then, and then we got good at it pretty quick and everyone learned new ways of working. And I think what has been astonishing, like the biggest surprise of all of it is, is anyone that works in this space, all of these amazing companies I work with, production companies, post houses, people like you, you know, have, have pivoted on a dime, yeah? And like develop new workflows, um, new ways of working overnight to accommodate the fact that, you know, we cannot be more than, you know, two, we've got to be two meters apart, you know, we can't get close to each other, which, which transforms everything. Um, so I think that's been, been just, uh, you know, a really, really heartening thing in all of this. I and mean, Jesus, there's no silver lining really because it's a terrible, terrible, terrible time. However, I think, you know, the, I guess the creativity yeah. and ingenuity of the human spirit and in the face of adversity has been really, really remarkable. As someone who's immersed in television, almost immersed in front of the camera for many years or behind the camera and understanding the whole world, how well are we doing and how much, how much further have we got to go as a society to really understand how best to be delivered? You know, there's definitely some way to go, but I think what it's absolutely shown is, is the kind of willingness of the audience to adapt to change, right? So very, very quickly, you know, what we were seeing on the telly was pretty kind of lo-fi television and we were seeing, you know, um, loads of like the big shows suddenly made on zoom and yet you know the audience was completely comfortable with this you know and ratings didn't drop if anything you know ratings have been you know on the rise because everyone's obviously at home watching a lot more telly um so i i think you know it's it's really good to be reminded that that the audience is kind of adaptable they're open to change um 
and as long as the content is good, it doesn't really, I think right now we're accepting kind of a lower level of production values. I mean, much like this piece of content we're creating now, Nick. You know, I'm not there with you in person. It's not shot beautifully on a beautiful camera. The sound quality probably isn't that good. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, 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 it's still a good piece of content. I think all of these, you know, I mean, what's been remarkable, you know, look at kind of podcasts, how much they've exploded, right, the last couple of years. And it's so interesting how that hasn't really taken a hit at all. And even though there are a few kind of technical glitches here and there, and maybe, you know, the quality of the recording isn't quite as good as it was when people were in, in person and using fantastic mics, yeah. that's completely adapted. You know, I make television now and thankfully, we are back kind of, you know, on location and making TV and I don't go within two meters of anyone else. And so, you know, there's, there's a whole mind. I mean, honestly, it's an absolute minefield in terms of kind of writing all the protocols to deal with that, the COVID protocols, but everyone's, everyone's done it, you know, and, and I, and I wonder, I wonder, really what the future holds because I think we've learnt ways of working during this period that are going to continue for a very long time. So going back to something you said earlier about kind of your journey over the last 10 years you spent meeting some incredible people um, how they eat and how they live and um, so and presumably for you you've picked up loads of great stuff how again going to, to our society how quickly are we learning those type of lessons um, and has it been a source of frustration for you in terms of you be I suppose you've been You've been teaching us for the last 10 years about what we should be doing and it's only because of the pandemic and maybe we are starting to really this. You know, I think the thing is, like, Nick, around this stuff, until, until probably you have kind of some kind of awakening, like uh, individually, like a first-hand experience, I think it's quite hard to kind of change the habits of a lifetime overnight, right? For me, my, my big kind of epiphany with food and diet came came with my with my with my dad bless him right my dad I mean it's kind of it is a very very rare thing in the modern world well I say it's rare but actually it's kind of more common than you think uh malnutrition right you think malnutrition is something that you know is confined to you know countries where they don't have enough food to eat yeah um, but actually, chronic mal malnutrition happens here too. And the reason why it happens here is because although people have access to all the right foods, people have learned and their lifestyle means that they don't eat them, right? Okay. And uh, my dad was one of them, right? And bless him, he's not here anymore. because He didn't look after himself, you know, and he didn't eat the right foods. And he was, he was skinny as a rake. And when he had to have kind of life-saving surgery, his surgeon afterwards said to me, your dad sells are literally like candy floss, right? I can't stitch them back together because they have been malnourished for at least 20 years. And that is what a bad diet can do. And, you know, you'd look at my dad's diet on paper and probably would say, okay, you could do with a few more vegetables, but he ate a huge amount of processed foods. Um, a very, ate, ate very little fruit and vegetables, you know, his vitamin intake was kind of on the floor. And so I saw that firsthand. And then I saw firsthand, my dad was poorly for about seven years, saw firsthand what was happening, what was happening in hospitals and the food that was being served in hospitals. And then, and then I start to get to grips with, you know, well, where does this all start? And then, you know, I'll make a documentary about breastfeeding and then about formula food. And then about, you know, you start looking into kind of the, the global juggernauts. You know, like the, whole, the whole food system mm. needs revision. But what we're seeing right now is that because people are being confronted with their own mortality, we're in a global pandemic, you know, people are witnessing. I mean, God, I think all of us probably know someone that has died because of COVID. Yeah. You know, it's devastating. You know, oh, I had it in my own house. My husband fell sick 14th of March 2020. It was a week before the lockdown. He got really, really poorly. You know, we had to call that number in the middle of the night, the NHS number, a couple of times thinking, oh, my God, he can't really breathe. Someone's going to come and pick him up in a minute. Paramedics going to come and whisk him away. Thankfully, he's still, still here. But, you know, it's on a knife edge. You know, I know people that are in their 40s and didn't make it. Um, so people now are being confronted with their own mortality. And I think people are making changes, you know, when it comes to their lifestyle. Because as well, there's all the, you know, working online and you're at your desk, you're kind of looking at a screen all day, every day. 
people realize I feel better on a day when I go and exercise for an hour, be it a walk, be it a run, be it a workout online, and I get to kind of connect with the community. I think because our lives have become so restricted, people have greater awareness when they feel better. And usually when they feel better is when they do a bit of exercise, they get outside, they connect with nature, they eat good food. And there's more awareness around that because we're not distracted by all of the noise of, you know, parties, people going out, drinking hangovers, Mm. you know, all of that stuff can kind of crowd really how you're actually feeling. So now if you're thinking about your next kind of documentary or your next plan for what you'd like to do, do you kind of, have you repositioned your thought process around the fact of actually people are listening? I'm not saying they weren't listening before, but kind of now actually they're taking on board and they're looking to make changes. Does that reposition the types of messages you're trying to educate us all out there with? Or for you, is it just kind of, you're happy that everyone's caught up with you? Well, look, I think, you know, I think appetite has increased and you see this, you know, you see it in the numbers, you know, for instance, an immunity doc went out on BBC Two that ordinarily would probably get a million and it, and it hits over two million. Um, you're seeing that in people's kind of, you know, they're more receptive to this kind of content that we're putting out there in the world. And that's right now, you know, but who knows what will happen when everything gets back to normal yeah. again, you know, and all those distractions come in again and we get back to normal life. Who knows? I can imagine, though, I think kind of, you know, this um, this awareness of well-being and wellness is here to stay. And you're seeing that actually, you know, it's being recognized within big corporations as well. Um as a case in point, a place that I worked, a big organization for a long time, uh, Channel 4, you know, I mean, as one example, you know, they've completely kind of transformed their approach now to well-being of their employees and the kind of things that are on offer. You feel positive, you feel like kind of the steps ahead would lead to good excitement and interesting times? Yeah, I am. I am. And for me, for me personally, I mean, pandemic and everything has really made me you know, it made me jump off the hamster wheel, mm. which I probably haven't done for 20 years. Yes. You know, when I started working, uh, you know, and, and, and Nick, you know what our game's like as well. You work and work and work, don't you? We work and work because we love it. Um, but there isn't much time for kind of pause and reflection. And that is what COVID definitely brought me. Um, and so, yeah, I got out of London. I, I thought, you know what, now's the time to practice what you preach really properly you know I've I I have had the privilege of meeting some of the healthiest people on the planet and you know they're they're nonagenarians they're reaching their kind of 100th birthday and they eat kind of the best diets in the world and they have the healthiest lifestyles um and there are there's a bunch of you know you can distill those down to basically almost like a kind of creed for living Mm. and there's a few basic things that you can do which I certainly wasn't doing in my kind of small flat in London I've moved I've left I've left and then uh yeah I'm tempting my own good life love to hear it Kate thanks so much for your time it's as always been a pleasure speaking to you oh thanks Nick take care